but I can't. I have so many people I love, and many of them are sitting in this audience tonight that I know so well. I was hoping it would be strangers that they did but I know. I told want. them they'd have to go to Morocco to find strangers. <laughs> uh, so maybe Dick, who's much better at this, will have a better answer for me. Well, when it comes to role models, I have many, and some of them became role models over a single thing or a single action. Uh, I'm thinking mostly in terms of a medical career, but uh, one of the many people I admired, now long dead, uh, Dr. Harry Corden, who became the uh, dean, uh, dean of medicine at, um, at the Montefiore Hospital in, in New York. Uh, and he was a superb, he was a pediatrician, of course, which put him in a class by himself, uh, <laughs> but uh, he once, said something that I remember verbatim he, about the doctor's job. He said, the doctor's job is to relieve anxiety. And everything that we do in the way of diagnosis, treatment, and even research is only a means to that end. To me, that's an extremely profound statement because we doctors, and I'm no exception, have a habit of talking too much and not listening enough. Sir William Osler once said, listen to the patient, he is giving you the diagnosis. And it's a lesson that takes a lifetime to learn and one never learns it completely, but I certainly found that the longer that I was in the practice of medicine, the less I talked and the more I listened. And I used to teach interviewing to the medical students and talked about this a great deal. And I would say to them, if when the patient leaves their office, there's not, if they're not smiling, there's something you didn't do right. And uh, it's perhaps the hardest lesson for a doctor to learn is to keep his or her big mouth shut and listen to the patient because that is time. I, I've often, I used to teach interviewing to medical students and I would drag an unsuspecting couple of parents down from the ward, people I'd never met before, and get their permission to interview them in front of the students. And invariably, I would throw into the middle of the interview a question. I would say to them, tell me, you folks have seen quite a number of doctors, what's the most important thing about a doctor that you look for? And their answers, and I did this with many, many patients, were stunningly consistent. The first thing they wanted was enough time. And the second thing they wanted was a doctor who explains things to me using words I can understand. And I would usually interrupt them and say, have you ever talked to a doctor who used words you didn't understand? Oh yeah. And I'd say, tell me, did you stop and ask for an explanation? Usually the conversation became nonverbal. They would shake their heads. I'd say, why not? Standard answer, I was afraid he would think I was stupid. These are some of the lessons that are not in the textbooks, but that are, in my view, some of the most important things about physicians dealing with patients. Thank you, and of course, you've just given pure evidence to why you're a role model for me as I care about things in healthcare. And another little fact that you may not know, one of the reasons why Ruth is a role model for me, in addition to many other things about the, you know, the makeup, um, she taught me how to wash for shoplifters. Uh, when <laughs> You'll never forget that, will you? Never. It, it, it was a live demo. It was fantastic. <laughs> so that was my training in New Waterford. Uh, in in New Waterford, they call them thieves. <laughs> <laughs> so the two of you have done so much, and you've taken on things, you know, difficult projects sort of something from nothing. Uh, and you make it look easy. Uh, so I'm gonna to get to the easy question in a minute, but what triggers your interest to start something? Uh, have you ever been asked to do something and you just go, I don't know, it's just deadly dull, dull and boring. I, what is it that gets you hooked? Well, it's very easy for me to answer that. When I was asked if I would consider being the first woman to lead the, uh, head up the United Way campaign, 
I said, no, no, no. I think you have to get a corporate person who knows that he can call the president of many organizations because next week he'll be called to give money to their problems. And uh, they said, no, we need to have one woman start it because it's always been a corporate man and it's always been a ma male. So I said, well, give me a few days, let me think about it. And I went home and thought, I can't ask, and I have to say this is the truth, I can't ask for five cents if I don't believe it in my heart. And I said, if you give me a few days, I would like to visit some of the 50 agencies under the umbrella of the United Way. And the first was an A, they said certainly, and it was near where we lived, and I was the Arthritis Society, I remember. And I went to this man's office upstairs, I can't remember his name, and said, hi, my name is Ruth Goldblum, I'm thinking of heading up the campaign, but I wondered if there is something, you've been a recipient uh, of the United Way for a long time, is there anything we could do for you that you really would like to see done, and we're not doing it? And he said, let me sit down. I've never been visited. I guess I take their money, but nobody's ever asked me what I do with it. So that sort of triggered it. And then I moved around and I went to a daycare center uh, in East Preston, I think it was, uh, which could have been a model for daycare centers across Canada. And I spoke to the person there. And then I went to a school in the north end of Halifax where children probably had the only hot meal of the day, and sometimes the only meal. And after visiting uh, the, then a We Care, some people in the audience might know about this place, which is a, a home, a, a place for children with disabilities, major ones. And I spent about an hour or, t or two looking at them, and then I suddenly said, yes, I can do this, I can do this, it's in my heart, the need is there, I, can, I don't mind asking, I don't mind groveling, I don't mind the knee and the groin technique for people, <laughs> I, I'll just do it, I'll just do it. And I came back and said yes, and fortunately for me, we were successful. But while I just think this just triggered a thought, I had to give a speech to a very large public service group. And standing in front of me was Dr. Ed Grand. Grantmeyer, who was head of radiology at the IWK, one of his twin daughters, I think it was Jane. And I was about to make my pitch for the United Way, and I suddenly had a flashback to a story about her. She was a uh, social worker, and she'd been sent to Cape Breton Island to a daycare center in Glace Bay, and uh, walked in to do an assessment and evaluation for them walked in and saw all the little tables around with four and five year olds playing mummy and daddy at the tables and so on. And one little boy took his fork and banged it on the table and said, I want my supper and I want my supper now. And the little girl said, stood up, took off her apron, put her hands on her hips and said, to hell with you, I'm going to bingo. <laughs> I've never forgotten that. <laughs> I was out of the question, so we did well, and I did it. But anybody, it's like what you're doing tonight. If you believe in the cause, uh, why we are here, and for the Chester uh, uh, Art Center, and there's such a need for it, and it's such a wonderful example for everybody in Nova Scotia to see what you're doing, you can go out and raise the money for it. I think that's what you, is that the kind of thing? A absolutely, and, and the demo on, uh, on the daycare was perfect. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs>